Hello and welcome to Book Lovers Companion. My name is Edith and right next to me is my lovely co-host, the Chattering Teacup. Hello. And here with us from the dark side, Kamaya Tapley. <laughs> Hello, Kamaya, and welcome at Book Lovers Companion. Hello. <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> Wonderful to have you on our show. Well, the first question is, of course, what drew you to the dark side? Was it just the biscuits or cookies, as you say, in the United States or something else? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, I, I just have that type of personality. I just I just like to be scared, you know, <laughs> <laughs> scary movies or comedies for me. <laughs> ah, you're that kind of person. I see. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. You can answer my question because sometimes they're the nicest people, fun and, and lovely, and they love to write gory stuff. Yes. Why is that? <laughs> This combination. Uh, you know, I think that uh, at least in my point of view and stuff, like we just look at, uh, you know, blood and gore and all that type of stuff as just uh, something just logical, something fun, something <laughs> Something that you can experiment with. It's it's nice to uh, expand your creativity in that that sort of way and stuff like oh you know I'm, I'm usually a nice person now how am I going to be like if I'm a little creepier? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, makes sense to me. And maybe is it also because this way it is safe? No, because no. I like to live on the wild side. Oh. <laughs> This is the wild wild west. Uh. <laughs> Unlike here. I like it. But, I mean, you're, you have written 13 novels. You've also written yeah. poems, songs, and screenplays. And your most recent books are called Gumdrop Hollow and Lilith. Both came out in 2022. And you mentioned it before we started recording that Gumdrop Hollow, let's start with this, shall we? Yeah. If it's okay? Yes. Yeah. Because we divided the books between us and I read Gumdrop Hollow because it's historic. It's always okay. my, my thing. And of <laughs> course, uh, because the fact that it is set in Germany in the past. What or why more exactly gave you the idea to write this kind of story? I mean, it's unusual. You're not German. You live in the United yeah. States. And w w why this... Krampus story. Now I gave it away, but this is also in the description on Amazon. Why Krampus? Um, well, my favorite holiday is Christmas, um, but I am a spooky girl, so I'm like, oh, there's no, I'm like, there's no Christmas demons. There's none. Um, and I also just happen to have a larger fan base in Germany. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but a lot of books that are downloaded are there. Oh. Um, so I'm like, okay, th that book set in Germany was an ode to them, and I'm like, you know what? Let's let's focus on you know, a Christmas demon in that area that it's Krampus and not enough books are written about Krampus, you know? Mm. Yeah. It's not, it's not something that is widely known in the U S I suppose, but there was a film right. a few years ago called Krampus uh, made in yeah. Hollywood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was also an Austrian actress who was in the film. We, we spoke about it just before we came on. I think it was Christa Stadler who, who you played the, the, I think the grandmother in the, oh, in the that film. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's widely known here, mm -hmm. uh, especially in Austria. Uh, um, I would say everywhere in the Alpine regions of the German speaking world, just like you said, um, mm -hmm. Germany, only the southern part of Germany, Bavaria, Austria, of course, and also Slovenia, some parts of Italy as well. I mean, he was present for us as a child, wasn't he? But, but He was. Oh. Apart from Krampus, it gets a bit confusing yeah. with different countries because he's more or less partnered with Niccolo, it's like Saint Nicholas, and he looks a bit like um, Santa Claus. Well, it comes to Christmas. You mean in the Nicholas, United States? Saint Nicholas looks a bit yeah. like Santa Claus, but uh, Krampus looks a bit like we imagine the devil would look yeah. like. Yeah, but right. but so. It's, it can be confused with Santa Claus and St. Nicholas because it's maybe there's the same beginning somewhere, I don't know, but uh, it's different dates and uh, in different countries, so it um, oh. might get a bit confusing. And Krampus is separate. Yeah, and it's not all fun and lovely before Christmas, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. And your Especially the family foods. 
Uh, around Christmas? Yeah. Or maybe <laughs> after, I don't know. <laughs> during or during, who knows? <laughs> and uh, something else, what what um, inspired you to write this um, strange kind of town or, um, or family uh, moves to? I mean, it's creepy right from the start, yeah. but what gave you the idea for this for this kind of town and how you you put it on paper? Oh, man. So I, I was really kind of thinking like, uh, which I'm gonna call it just with them moving there, I was kind of thinking what's, what's something new for them? You know what I mean? Um, as you already know, they're coming out of serfdom. So that's all they've ever known. They've never mm -hmm. been exposed to anything else. So for me, it was a nice, um, creepy introduction to them and to what for that time period would be their first step into a modern day society. And, you know, they're kind of, kind of ignorant and stuff like they don't know really what's going on and stuff like they know maybe they shouldn't trust people but they're kind of like uh ah. I, I think that's kind of a, a scare a hidden scary element in my mm -hmm. opinion and it is a young adult novel uh, my first one my only one so I think that's a nice little hint to hint for scariness for mm -hmm. everybody <laughs> mm -hmm. what about the sisters the sisters are quite different mm -hmm. in their characters I mean we have the older one Helene or Helen, as you would call them in English. And we have Hannah. Mm -hmm. She is supposed to be in danger. And right. we have different, different, like I said, different characteristics in both of them. How would you describe them from your point of view? Yeah, I definitely think Helene's a little more carefree. You know, she's been in serfdom her whole life. And just uh, from her perspective, they have two different perspectives. So from her perspective, she's like, I get to have some freedom. You know, I get to be who I am, I get to experience this city for what it is and stuff and just be free and live my life. And um, Hannah's a little more like, I don't know, she's a little more reserved. Like, so even though she's the baby of the family, she's a little more like, I'm um, a little apprehensive, you know, with this move, like, should we really be trusting everything? Like, you know, she's kind of a buzzkill, I guess, of what a lot of people will say. But I think she's the only one who really notices things. And I thought that was nice to do because I think that um, children or preteens or teens just aren't given enough credit uh, for being as observant as they are and stuff. So I wanted to make her kind of an observer. Hmm. What would you say, um, looking back at writing this novel, what was your biggest challenge? Um, <laughs> keeping it uh, PC. Definitely keeping it PC. <laughs> Keeping uh, curse words out, keeping the death scenes to a minimum, because I'm I was just the hardest part was really just trying to rein myself in. So I'm like, oh man, I want to do this, I want to do that, but I'm like, oh, I'm writing this for kids, like <laughs> just reel it back. <laughs> but uh, that was the only hard part. Everything else was really fun. Mm. Okay, and may I ask? I mean, without giving too much away, of course, where did the idea with the oranges come from? So, um, which one call it? At least what I've read in my studies and stuff is that if you, um, from some of the tales that I read, if you give Krampus um, an orange and stuff like, or you know, because at that period of time and stuff like, uh, gifts were very limited. You know, you you know, give your kids like a piece of fruit and stuff. Yeah. And so at that time, uh, at least the legend goes and stuff for me that um, you would encompass a piece, an orange and mm -hmm. stuff or a fruit, any type of fruit. Um, and they would accept it instead of taking the child away. Oh. And so it was really important for a lot of families to have fruit so that they could be like, hey, take this offering so you don't take our children. Uh -huh. Why has nobody ever told us that, Teacup? Did you know that? I no, didn't. no, it's completely new to me. I had What? known that. <laughs> If yeah. I had known that as a child... <laughs> they, they didn't tell us so that we're scared oh, that might be you the know, case you guys are the experts so now I'm like <laughs> I gotta do my research again <laughs> I'm like did no. I not do it <laughs> no 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 we are definitely not experts no, believe me <laughs> we, we were just we were just afraid on the 5th of December hoping there was just St. Nicholas coming by mm -hmm. but there were always one or two maybe even three of them with him I, ne I never saw one. No, you didn't? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, they were no there. No one ever came to my house. I mean, it, it's oh, cool they that when they gave us presents, but I mean, no, 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 no. I mean, 
Oh, it, it, it sounds a bit strange when I say I'm from the countryside. I mean, don't get me wrong, the countryside <laughs> in Austria is different than the countryside in the US, of course. But in the villages, we did have the tradition of St. Nicholas coming, coming by the houses. And like I said, he usually had one, two, sometimes even three of them with him. Hmm. They had changed, they were rattling the chains and um, they had ways to punish uh, the naughty children and so on, but you were mostly scared. I mean, nothing happened, of course. So, yeah, but I love learning, soaking yeah. it all in. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, we had this. We had these um, a church. We had those. Um, what shall we call it? Events where where Saint Nicholas came and gave gifts to the children. But uh, at church, there was no there was no Krampus, just Saint okay. Nicholas. So. I didn't know that about the origin. I have to talk with my parents. Definitely, I have to talk with them <laughs> about it. <laughs> the, the, the only story I have is that I, I was told by my parents that at one point, when I was a child, they asked someone to come by. I don't know if it was as a St. Nicholas or a Krampus. I don't know, maybe both. But um, they never showed up. <laughs> <laughs> so just, didn't they just took the money and I'm not sure it's the money I don't know but <laughs> didn't happen and may I also ask I mean um, you, you put in quite a few German words did you get yeah. any help from a German speaking friend or something like that yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's really honestly it's really important if I'm going to get my hands in another culture to kind of know and stuff what I'm talking about and stuff because you know Google can only do so much yeah <laughs> so, true so yeah. yeah I do have a couple um I'm originally well from a lot of places but I spent most of my life in Vegas mm -hmm. and I don't know if you guys know about Vegas Vegas is a little bit more of a melting pot mm -hmm. uh so it's it's very easy mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to know somebody who like knows that language and stuff and a culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you said at the beginning that the dark or the horror part of fiction drew, draws you in. And mm -hmm. uh, walk with us along the path of you becoming a dark fantasy horror and thriller author. Oh, man. At <laughs> first, uh, well, I mean, when I first got into writing, um, I started writing like romance novels. Mm -hmm. Like the first two are romance novels. And I'm like, oh, this is boring. <laughs> but um I've always since I was a kid actually I used to be really into history like growing up like all around the world like it's just it's just always been my thing and even today like I still travel to like different countries and stuff like that and uh one of the things that really interests me was the myths and legends of each country mm -hmm. um so as I began writing and stuff I was thinking well you know let me research more into this myth oh this is interesting so you know, writing fantasy was cool, but I'm like, oh, I, I just need to be a little spicier. So, like, <laughs> so I was like, let me let me write a little bit of um, blood and gore. Let me write a little bit of horror into this. Let me creep people out. Because this is something that I wish that I could have, you know, seen a little bit more of. Horror is kind of underrepresented mm. in my uh, humble opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe, do you think that's a fashion thing? We, we spoke about this with our, our guest la, uh, last week, that it, like fantasy, horror as well uh, is, mm, like you said, underrepresented. And mm -hmm. there's always a kind of fashion with different kinds of genres. Do you think that's true? Like the real fashion? I think that the issue with the horror not being as represented as much as, you know, it could be, is just that um, people don't deem it as tasteful, hmm. uh, especially when they're not into horror and stuff. Like if they're not, um, you know, in influenced by like the culture and like, you know, movies and books and all that mm -hmm. type of stuff, like seeing it on occasion will definitely make it a little more like, uh. so people think it's a little more, you know, tasteless, but I, th I think it does have an art to it. Um, I think people like uh, Anne Rice and uh, Stephen King had definitely helped kind of expand people's minds a little bit more into the into the visions yeah. of horror. So, you know, it's growing. Yeah. <laughs> yep, definitely. And would you also say that now that you've mentioned um, Anne Rice and Stephen King, would you say 
um, horror also have some sort of subgenres, like for example, crime fiction? Yes, yes, 100%, 110%. Um, I like to say that I write dark fantasy slash horror mm -hmm. um, because mine specifically hones in on already existing myths and legends and just mm -hmm. putting a twist on them. Um, whereas, yes, crime thrillers definitely have horror elements and, you know, romantic horrors and stuff. There's there's definitely subgenres for sure. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's more difficult or easier to um, base your stories on existing myths or creating your, your own? Um, I think it's, that's an interesting question because I did kind of, I have them both um creating my own which mother mike and the world of realms were was my own 100 mm -hmm. everything everything um and existing legends i think that uh it's a little bit easier to um to create something that of an existing legend because there are people that already resonate with it um there are people that are going to understand a little bit more like what i'm talking about <laughs> um so even if i change like the features of something um even if i change the way something is like it's people understand like as long as i use like oh this is a vampire a ghost or a werewolf you know mm -hmm. you know what i mean they'll they'll get it Krampus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> would you also say that since you mentioned Anne rice and stephen king i mean they are very prominent figures when when talking about horror would you say that because i, I read Uh, the, the the one or other horror novel every now and again uh, that women or female writers are also underrepresented in this specific genre. One hundred ten percent. One hundred ten percent. I think, and even going further um, for myself, you know, being a black female author um, who does go into horror and fantasy genre, I get a lot of racism. Um, I get a lot of misogyny. Um, and sometimes it's a little bit hard to deal with, um, especially social media, like my DMs, my, tw my Twitter messages, my, um, TikTok, you know, TikTok comments and stuff. Like if there's a lot of racism, um, and there's a lot of misogyny, like I get told very often that I should not be writing more. Um, I need to get out. I need to stop taking white people's tales. You know what I mean? Like, even though the, a lot of these legends are around the world, you know, mm -hmm. so It's it's a uh, it's difficult. So number one, yes, being a woman in horror, very hard, very hard to get respect. No one will, will respect you in horror, unfortunately. Um, and then being black, it's even harder. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting because because um, you know, Octavia. I mean, no, she's dead. Uh, but Octavia E. Butler. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I only read one book by her, um, Fletchling. Mm -hmm. And it was great. I mean, I in absolutely enjoyed her take on the vampire myth. Right. This was so great. And when I when when I was at the end of the novel, I thought, okay, where's the next one? Then I looked up. <laughs> then I looked up and I realized, oh, she died. The next one. Yeah. Right. Never mind. <laughs> hmm. Too bad, actually. And yeah. Uh, regarding horror or dark fantasy, uh, where would you say lies your absolute love? I mean, we, we just mentioned the subgenres. Where, right. where, where, where is your heart in the subgenre? Oh man, if I were <laughs> if I were at gunpoint, forced to choose, <laughs> you, let's elevate the stakes a little bit. Um, definitely fantasy, probably. Mm. That's probably where everything lies. Because I feel like you can create whole worlds mm -hmm. in fantasy mm -hmm. as opposed to horror you have to be a little more uh realistic mm -hmm. uh, but in fantasy you can be extremely weird mm -hmm. so <laughs> <laughs> probably there ah, okay so you so you do enjoy the world building you have to do in fantasy yeah. that's your yeah uh, okay that's your kind of thing yeah. mm -hmm. and <laughs> could you somehow pinpoint where there is the, the border between uh crime thriller and when it tips into horror Because some horror books are not mm. that, I say, not that dark, yeah. or gory. Right. So right. right. I think when you start to get into is something being creepy, you know what I mean? Like is something being getting getting to the inside of how you feel. You're touching your fears a little bit. 
um, whenever something is, at, I don't want to say adding blood because mm-hmm. something doesn't need to be, um, you don't need to have murder for it to be a horror story. Yeah. It has to be terrifying. Yeah. If it's terrifying, if it's spooky, you know, creepy, you know, legally and stuff, I guess you can call some things like horror and stuff, but it's, is it really spine tingling? Then it's probably not a mystery. That's probably definitely horror. Mm-hmm. Actually, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to drag this point on. But no, it's okay. It's okay. Go on, go on, go on. But um, my friend and I were actually talking about horror specifically um, and the way that it caters to different audiences, um, specifically the way it caters to men and women, mm-hmm. uh, having that be different. Because I know a lot of um, horror movies and books will include um, assault scenes and mm-hmm. that's not horror for men but it's horror for a woman True. because that can happen to it. That's absolutely something that mm-hmm. can happen. to it. Not that it can, can't happen to men, but at, at a grander scale, yeah. that's something that yeah. is very um, likely to happen to us. Yeah. So it's, it's scary. It's terrifying for us. That's real horror for us. Whereas for them, maybe it's still just an action. Maybe it's still just a thriller. So I definitely think those lines get blurred a lot when you think about somebody's fears. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What would be for men horror, do you think, then? Murder. Murder. <laughs> <laughs> just, just killing people, you know what I mean? Like, I think that, uh, you know, maybe maybe for men, just um, regardless of gender, mm-hmm. uh, taking out, like, an, an assault scene and stuff like that, like, the murder obviously applies to, <laughs> to women as well, but I think for them, it would be creepy to have that power taken away. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, when you're murdered, your powder is taken away. And so for them, I think that's definitely, definitely the key. Mm-hmm. Something yeah. like Saw and stuff, like mm-hmm. someone mm-hmm. intricately, you know, playing a game with you and just taking all your power. Yeah, that's that's scary for them. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it seems like um, all the elements that are horror to men are also horror to women. But uh, just for women, there are some more um, situations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely, yeah. yeah that, because, like she said, yeah. an assault is for us horrific. Yes, for men it needs a, a bit more, a step further. Yeah. You have to go a step further yeah. because mm-hmm. they are not as likely to be victims of assault as women are. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, horror, of course. I mean, like you said, it's gory, it's bloody, and such. Is mm-hmm. there anything? at all you would not put in a horror novel because even for you you would say that's a no-no uh the big so i have two rules whenever i write a book um i don't put any racial Mm -hmm. and uh no sexuality trauma Mm -hmm. and stuff like i don't no homophobia and stuff like i am i think that we've had enough you know what i mean like i think there's a there's enough like personal life experiences there's enough in movies um, really detailing racial, you know, inequality and homophobia. I don't think I, I am not here to present that to anybody. And I don't want to bring that trauma. That's, that's real life trauma mm-hmm. and stuff to somebody. And, you know, if you can't write a horror novel without including those things, maybe, maybe you're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, honestly, like maybe, maybe you're not that good. You, you know, you have to touch on other things. Yep. And if those are the main things for you, Maybe you should question where you are. Yeah. Yeah. And never kill a dog or a cat. Never. I never have that in my books. Never. Because I, I would literally just, that would be the end for me. That's my 13th reason. <laughs> like, if something happened to Jalupa, I would lose it. So, no. <laughs> but, but, but there is something to it. Because if, the, if I watch a, a film or read a book and something happens, someone breaks into a house and there is a dog or a cat in where I was like, okay, I hope the dog survives. I hope the cat survives. I don't care about the people living there. <laughs> I hope they survive. I don't know why. It's crazy. but. And you say you get creeped out by blood. I mean, come on. Oh, I've killed the people. <laughs> don't, never mind. But the cat, the cat, the cat. Yeah, I do. It's, it's a rule. I think it's a golden rule also for crime writers. Don't I mean, kill I, I, the dog. I would never write yeah, exactly. to the to the author and complain, but it's nah. oh god, that's terrible. Um, yeah, it's, yeah it's, 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 it's harder to take. I yep. know. Yep, definitely. I feel the same way. Whenever they kill an animal, like for example, in I don't know if you guys seen the movie Fear, but when mm-hmm. they like uh, push the dog's head 
through the dog door and it was just a dog sever head. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Ruin. No. no. So do you think you would write a dark version or a, a even darker version, let's say, of Lord of the Rings? Yeah, that's what uh, Mother Mike in an Award of Realms is, essentially. Uh, which is one of my books. Um mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I I have, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, see? <laughs> yeah, perfect. Now, so, so now you can write a prequel. Oh yes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it would be timely at the moment, wouldn't it? I mean I wonder why. Oh, no idea why that would be. No clue. Uh, whatsoever. <laughs> Teacup and, of course, our guest. The second <coughs> book, Lilith, which came out uh, only this year. Tell us about it. I think a connection oh, there yeah. is misogyny. Hmm. <laughs> so Lilith is about, so initially about a girl named Noelle. Um, she is kind of on like her last ring and stuff like, just like, I want to be a creative like my parents, but I'm really kind of failing here. Like, what am I going to do? Uh, and then she meets, um, Lilith, uh, who is another woman who's just not that interested in her. And first it's kind of like, oh, like we can go on a date and stuff, but you know, it's not, I'm not sure if I want to be involved with you and stuff, but I don't, they just have really strong attraction and they just end up together. And just all of a sudden, like, no, is just doing better. Like she's now able to sell her stuff and, you know, she quit smoking and all these things and they're together and blah, blah. But they end up going to a uh, assault survivors group and hearing the stories. And for me, kind of the ropey weight situation um, <laughs> definitely inspired a little bit. Um, I, I'm not gonna lie. This is not for anybody who likes men. <laughs> this is not a book for that. Um, I kind I just wanted to write a book about that. Um, just getting back at people who have taken the word no from you. You know what I mean? Like, and this is people who have assaulted even um, cis women and trans men or trans women and trans men too. And just, just, men who have taken that power away and stuff and just, you know, and then they just go off and kill them <laughs> together as a couple while dealing with relationship problems. So that's really what the book's about. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing occurred to me uh, now that um, this time around, uh, the men are the victims. Yeah. Usually the women yeah. are the victims. So it's uh, turn around. And it's a bit, it seems a bit like a revenge on men in this yes. book. I think it could have been written as a romance story if you left a few bits out. <laughs> Without that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> was it too gruesome for you, Teacup? Because you are a no, rather squeamish no, no, it, one. It was, it was okay. <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it was okay. okay. <laughs> Maybe a bit of blood, but it, it wasn't... A bit. <laughs> tiny bit, tiny bit. Oh. Um... I don't know, it, it wasn't that, in, in this book, it wasn't that creepy. Oh. Yeah. So it, otherwise it would have been different, but. Oh. Yeah, but being creepy, wouldn't you also say, Kamaya, that being creepy or um, establishing this feeling of horror uh, has to leave a lot to the imagination? No. Nope. Uh, with this only because well only because um with this it's really just blatant in your face on why people should be scared because these people are committing these crimes and you don't know why you don't know who they are uh that's that's kind of the scary part like anybody they, any of these men can be taken and you know as essentially punished for their crimes mm -hmm. but they don't know who's doing it and they don't know what's going to happen to them mm -hmm. it's just it's one of those things it kind of um It touches on what I'm saying, what I was saying earlier about um, what scares men, mm -hmm. um, what what is horrific to men, mm -hmm. which is someone taking their power away, um, and it's more, <laughs> it's someone they don't even know. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it's yeah. just a uh, for them, it's definitely a horror type novel. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, true. But uh, the the classic horror stories. Wouldn't you mm -hmm. say that the imagination is far stronger than what actually happens sometimes in the books? Sometimes. 
Yeah. I, I, w- I would say sometimes, like, for example, uh, Perfume by uh, Peter Suskind. Or Patrick. Suskind? Patrick, Patrick Suskind. Suskind. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. That's my favorite book. Um, and that book's a little more, in my opinion, involves some imagination a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and I love it. Yep. I love yep. it 100%. The tough thing, honestly, though, about it is that a lot of people aren't, um, they kind of want more things in your face now. Wow, they okay. want things a little more spelled out mm-hmm. now than something um, <clears throat> that's at least obvious to me, okay. but isn't obvious to them. You know, they don't really like to look under the layer. They kind of just want everything because, you know, they read a lot of, they are not read, but they listen to audiobooks, audiobooks mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of a tough thing for myself these days. I want to be more um, I want to have more of that lingering, creepy type feeling where you have to use your imagination a bit more that you're referencing earlier. Um, it's just a little hard because a lot of people want things kind of more in your face. Mm-hmm. Do you think that audiobooks changed it in the in the recent past or just yes. that 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 changed that brought the change? One hundred percent. Because in my opinion, I think that, you know, when someone has an audiobook, usually they're doing something else like driving or, yeah. Yeah. you know, or cooking or but so they need things, something yeah. that's going to be, you don't have time to think because you're doing something else. Like you're an adult. There's, there's a lot of stuff we've got to get done. Um, so I think it's hard to really sit there and think about what's really happening. And, you know, audiobooks makes it easier for you to read. And just, if you have something there in your face and just blatant that you don't mm-hmm. have to think about, it's just easier. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I'm not an audiobook uh, person, so yeah. But you, yeah, you do. Yeah, have a point. I, I've never thought about that, of course. Oh. To be honest, mm-hmm. and yeah, sorry. I Pick think up. the creepiest moments in in Lilith are the short passages where the victims group or survivors group meets, mm-hmm. and they tell the stories. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. a little part of the book, but. Because it can happen to a lot of people. And that's why it's yeah. creepy and it really happens. Uh, those stories are stories that actually happened uh, oh. to some of my friends. Like I, I specifically spoke to my friends and asked them like if they were okay with me, including like mm-hmm. certain things. Um, and, you know, they gave their consent and they were okay with it. But that's, that was, that's a horror part of it for, yeah. to me and stuff. Like, this, is, this is something that has actually happened and will honestly probably happen again ends up it's it's That's seems hard. realistic as it is and you as an independent author what is the greatest challenge for being an independent author from your point of view because we had quite a few uh, independent authors on our show and i'm <laughs> always wondering if there's differences in what they feel is a challenge for them hmm ah oh, man what what is really the challenge the challenge is just um It's not within the product itself because I love writing books. I love creating the covers. I I love everything that has to come with being an author. Um, The main challenge is getting respect also as an independent author. Mm. Um, Because a lot of people say like, oh, you're not published and stuff. Like (laughs) even if you're self-published, oh, you're not published. Or they'll be surprised because, you know, not to dunk my own donut here, but... (laughs) My my covers are a little um, they're they're pre- they're premium. I like to I like to think so. Um, so it, they don't assume that I'm a self published author. But I'm like, being self published doesn't have anything to do with it. It has everything to do with you know your interest and willing to learn certain things. Like, are you willing to learn graphic design? Are you willing to learn how to edit your book properly? Like, that's so that's res- getting respect from others is the toughest part. I think. Mm. And you mentioned uh, earlier that being a woman, a black woman in a genre like horror is hard. What about the feedback from your readers? You you also said that um, I think Gumdrop Hollow is downloaded more in Germany also, or, yeah. or, or, or uh, Europe. So what about mm-hmm. what about the feedback you get there for your books? I honestly like I usually get pretty good feedback on like my books because I don't. Uh, Like, like I mentioned earlier, I keep things a little more blatant and stuff and like in your face, but um, I, I usually get pretty good feedback, especially um, with certain scenes in Lilith. I've gotten pretty good <laughs> about that. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, Gumshot Paulo, especially like uh, the cover actually I've gotten a lot of feedback on, which was actually painted by one of my friends. So mm. that, 
I don't know. <laughs> I've got a lot of feedback on that. Um, but a lot of people have said it's fun. Um, it's fun to read. It's a new thing. Um, introducing them to Krampus because a lot of people are, you know, on this side of the world in America, like you said earlier, they don't know. And so, <laughs> so you know, it's it's nice to kind of introduce them to it. And it's nice for people who are in Germany to be like, oh, like so someone in America actually like cares about what's going on over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's nice to hear that from them. Mm-hmm. And my question is also for you as an author. Would you describe yourself as a planner or a painter? I ha- I, I'm a planner because I do oh. have <laughs> I do have a tendency to go off the rails. <laughs> 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 So whenever I write a book, I I stick to a strict outline. Mm -hmm. Um, I make the general plot, the setting, the characters, and I list, I make a paragraph for every chapter, what's going to be in the chapter, um, just so I know. Because for me, it's really easy to make a character's eyes green and then to make them brown later (laughs) because I just don't remember. Um, Or I'm just too lazy to control F and figure out what color (laughs) I made the eyes. So it's just one of the things I have to have to have to be organized just in this part of my life everything mm-hmm. else i can just do whatever <laughs> <laughs> um you said for gum Apollo, you had to rein yourself in to not write mm-hmm. too much because it's a young adult novel has it ever happened to you that you wrote something and then you said okay this could take a little bit more that's a good question that's a really good question um i i want to say yes but let me see which maybe I would really probably think maybe in Arc Midian, maybe I could have done a little bit more of the gore, you know, a little bit more of the gore scene. But I just didn't want to make it like a fully war, not like a, an action type book. I just didn't want to, I wanted to fully get into like Marcellus Arc Midian and his battle between Ares, the god of war, and Greece, and uh, Mars, the god of war, and Rome, and Rome. You know, I really wanted to like focus on that, but. I, I probably definitely could have included a few more death scenes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's what you would have liked included. Not the goal. Not not necessarily maybe maybe some some death scenes. You know, maybe a little bit of gore. Maybe a spear through the eye or something. <laughs> of course. Something casual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happens every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And you yourself as a reader, for example, I mean, authors usually read a lot. Where is your love as a reader? Where lies it as a reader? <sighs> Let's see. I mostly like reading, uh, I actually like reading young adult kind of, <laughs> which is, which seems weird. I know if, if I read, I do like young adults specifically because they're a little more um, imaginative than the you know, adult fiction. Cause like I told you earlier, like it's just a little bit harder. Like a, when you're an adult, you just have to be a little more blatant with certain things. But when you're a kid and stuff like, or a teenager or whatever, you're just worried about school and stuff. You really, those type of authors, I think see that you have a little bit more time to be a little bit more imaginative. So I like young adults specifically because of that. But, but really, <laughs> honestly, I'm a bit more of a movie watcher than a reader. Oh. I'll be honest. I'll be only because I'm a very uh, visual person. Mm-hmm. So when I write, I like you to be able to picture exactly what's happening, mm-hmm. um, exactly what the scene is, exactly what this person looks like. And movies kind of help me do that because I'm like, okay, I can see what the trees are. I can see what the landscape is. Um, it probably smells like this, this, and that. Like it's it's a little more helpful to me than some of the some of the books nowadays. Some of them I really like, like the Red Tent. I love that book. So the Sultan's Aram, I love that book. But uh, movies touch a little bit more on that for me. Mm-hmm. This this sense of place is more developed, would you say, also in young adult fiction? Yes. Okay. Yes, I definitely think so. I think you can see your surrounding area just a little bit more. But um, I don't know. I think it's a little bit more, I don't know, like, like I was saying before, like just a little bit more left to imagination mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. than some of the fiction adult novels. Mm-hmm. Do you think that fantasy is more prominent in young adult fiction? Oh, hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think that's actually great because it wasn't like that when I was growing up. 
um, the books in America, at least for us and stuff, like there weren't really very many fantasy novels and stuff, or not very many horror novels, like nothing you could really kind of look at. There were more like dramas Mm -hmm. and stuff, Um, a couple action type books and stuff. But uh, now I think people are writing a little bit more, maybe healing that inner child, who knows? Um, and catering fantasy a little bit more to a younger audience, but I, obviously they love them. You've got Harry Potter, <laughs> for example, that's one of the biggest ones. So yep. I think when they saw that hit, they were like, oh, <laughs> let's write a little more fantasy. <laughs> yeah. Do you think hmm. then that mm, when we compare, let's say, young adult fiction and adult fiction, for an English-speaking audience, especially in the United States, I always get the impression that publishers do underestimate their audience. Do you think that they don't make the same mistake with young adult fiction? Or maybe I'm completely wrong. I don't know. Honestly, only because I don't really have that much experience with actual publishers and kind of the intel and what kind of they're looking for in regarding to, you know, adult VS young adult but as far as reading in my opinion um i i do think they have actually they underestimate the adult audience a little bit more than they Mm -hmm. um do with the teenagers i think they give teenagers a little bit more credit now Mm -hmm. than um adults because teenagers are just a little bit more creative Mm -hmm. in their minds and stuff like they're still developing and stuff so i i think they they saw the market you know it's Mm -hmm. one of those things Whenever you see like a um, like if you want to see someone be successful, you get a Justin Bieber, <laughs> or you get you make a boy band or a girl group, whatever, um, and you appeal to teenagers because those are the ones that are asking their parents, "Hey, can you buy this?" Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll stop annoying you. It's it, it's one of those things. That's just an example and stuff. Yeah. But they're seeing the market, I think, in young adults, so mm-hmm. they're giving them a little bit more credit than mm-hmm. they did before. Maybe the market for adult books is more set and they have the different genres and that's it. And for mm-hmm. young adult novels, because they're more let's say, newer, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's not so set and they publish more, more books, more different genres. Or they give them more you know, freedom. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. But also, are you also afraid that you get pigeonholed with your books? Um, kind of. Kind of, um, I, I think I get a little bit pigeonholed because I think that um, with certain people, with certain uh, media outlets and publications, mm-hmm. whatever, they kind of put me in kind of this area. And so at, at first, when I first had my career, they were definitely putting me as just a romance author. That's mm-hmm. it. And that's that's all she writes. And I'm kind of just like, oh, uh, like a more multi-genre. So kind of in the middle ended up to being multi-genre. And now it's just... Um, thrillers and horrors which is it's an ironic thing because i love being known as like a thriller and a horror author but i have been pigeonholed into it so if i tried to branch out i don't know how successful i'd be to be completely honest i think i've kind of made my trademark and that can be kind of a good or a bad thing you know and do you also have as an author or maybe as a reader a guilty pleasure which you would love to read or do love to read but you wouldn't tell anyone except the millions who are listening to us of course or as an <laughs> or as an author you would you would love to read but oh sorry uh, love to write but haven't dared yet <sighs> let's see what you know what's it's funny that you say that because i was just like this week i've been thinking like what do i want to write next what do i want to write next and <laughs> I just I did decide on what I want to write next, um, but really I've kind of uh, hit most of the things that I really wanted. Um, the most important things to me, um, you know, I've written about Evil Mermaids, uh, Succubus, like <laughs> Lilith, and you know, Krampus, and just all these things, um, gods and stuff. So, you know, I've I've really touched on quite a few things. Um, one thing, you know, what I didn't do one thing while I was just blabbering. So <laughs> a Menengal. I don't know if you've heard of a Menengal, but um it's a Filipino legend uh-huh. um, where there's a person in the village who basically <laughs> detaches himself from their legs and mm-hmm. stuff. So it's just like the top half of their body and like grows wings and like 
kills like children. <laughs> but <laughs> I'll write that in my own way. But it's something I want to. It's something I want to write on. However, um, I'm very concerned about writing that just because I know people in that culture would not. I don't know. Probably would be a little concerned about the way I would approach it. Um, so it's one of those. I'm not really sure, but we'll we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> hmm. It is a concern with authors these days. Mm-hmm. I mean. I wasn't concerned when I read your Krampus book. I said, oh, no, good. It's 18, 1806. I mean, it's Germany, okay. It's our our area where we have a little bit experience, except for the oranges. But let's see what, what she made of it. So, I think, I think a, book, a book is a book, and you take from it whatever you want yeah. and whatever touches you. And I, in the end, either you like it or you don't, but that's it. It's... Mm. It's never a crime to write a book. No, give it a chance. It shouldn't be. Let's see. I mean, it's your take on the story. Yeah. So what what do you make of it, of Krampus? What did you make of Krampus when you started reading it or writing it? I was like, those kids deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it doesn't seem when like... I was like, these, these kids kind of deserve it. Like, <laughs> like, I, <laughs> yep. Doesn't yep. he only come to the bad ones? Yes, to the naughty S- ones. So. Yes. Yeah, but the idea, I mean, it's, 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 I've, I think it's always strange, this local local myth, how they develop. It would be interesting how they develop, to ha- where, when, and so on, isn't it? I mean, like you mm-hmm. said, myth or local myth or, or from different uh, nations, it's always interesting what they have compared maybe to others and maybe some some things are similar, some things are completely yeah. different. Right. So it's, I think it's always interesting to find out what do they see as the most dangerous. Yeah, but as, as we found out uh, with the oranges, um, if it's, 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 a, it's a legend or a myth from where you live, you mm. often never know much about it because yeah. you never research it. Yeah. When we're from somewhere else and you hear about it, you start researching it mm. and in the end know more about it than mm. the people living where it's actually set. Strangely yeah. enough. Strangely enough, because um, also the vampire myth, I mean, it was there since the ancient times. It became popular with Bram Stoker. But it was mm-hmm. there b- before that, or the I mean, idea, m- uh, or the idea of, there was of a, always something a, like that, like the succubus, like you said, yeah, eternal life, yeah. Or kind of life. But maybe it's because of that; <laughs> yeah. it's always been around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and there was this degree because that's how he found out there was this de- this degree by emp- emp- she wasn't an empress, Maria Theresia, you know, in Austrian in Austrian uh, history, and she issued this degree for certain parts of the empire where people were forbidden to dig up their dead because they believed they were vampires. So so she had to put an end to it. And I think um, Bram Stoker, he came to to Austria and Vienna and he he went through the archives and he found that degrees and that also gave him the idea for his story of of Dracula. So Interesting. As far as I know. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was in these certain parts of the empire where our uh, bloodsucker uh, lived. I mean, Dracula, he was a real figure. He was a real... Right. His, 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 Count Dracula. Yes, Dracul. Because he was a member of the order. Draculea, I think, was the was the name he had. Vlad, Vlad was his name. Yes. Vlad, Vlad the Impaler. The Impaler, was, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And I mean, that's what he did. And I mean, for his times, it was more or less normal. And it was war times. It was war times, so exactly. It's usually gruesome. Yeah, it's gruesome. I mean, he had to defend the empire uh, from the, the Ottomans. So mm-hmm. he wasn't a nice guy. He wasn't supposed to be a nice guy. So <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> there you have it. And you have the cuddly vampires nowadays. But same. Yeah, the sparkling vampires. Don't get me started. <laughs> What, what do you make of sparkling vampires? So I secretly love the Twilight series. <laughs> <laughs> secretly, but but the reason is because it has a nostalgic twist. When I was um, in college, my first year in college, that's when the books started coming out. And we would all just like trade the books around because that's what we had. Like it was a private school. 
So we just like (laughs) trade the books around. So for me, it's some nostalgia, but if I were introduced to it today, I'd be like, what is this? (laughs) I can, I can imagine that. Yeah. But you've never read them. I've never read them. I had to sit through, through the films. You made me. She made me sit through the films. What'd you think? <clears throat> I think the funny scenes were with the, I think it was a baseball game. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. I, and I love the idea of them being kind of vegetarians. Yeah. <laughs> and also this, I don't know if it's in, in, in the, only in the book or also in the films where they have where she's at a um, gas station and some people are talking about and she thinks it's about her but it's about the car yeah <laughs> a few funny scenes in there otherwise it, i mean it's, it's, it's a story but it's in one way it's well written because you read very fast you can read it very fast mm. so that that's uh it's just, a feature of yeah, it. I just but got mostly I just got annoyed with with him to be honest because he was he was the brooding type and he was ah yeah I think when he thought about his past or he told her about his past and he was talking about this woman he killed at the at the cinema or something like that and he was oh I killed a woman you're a fucking vampire for goodness sake that's what you do <laughs> yeah what's what's wrong with you yeah so right but, it really comes to the territory <laughs> yes. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, but, hmm. but it's happened in real life too that people, no, not the killing, the, the blood sucking, but that <laughs> vampires are not real, my dear. I know, but that people um, kind of <laughs> seem to hate what they are. Yeah, that's yeah, what I mean. yeah. Okay, okay. I cut him some slack then. Okay. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, okay. I wish I had fangs though. I do wish I had that at least. Like, because it, 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 it just didn't make sense. How are you punching flesh? <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. True. Yeah, absolutely. Kamaya, 13 yes. novels, poems, songs, screenplays. What would be your advice for any other independent aspiring author? <sighs> I always say this, and I live by it myself. Like, you have to be happy with your product at the end of the day. And the reason why I say it is because a lot of people are going to be mad and stuff, or a lot of people are not going to like you they're not going to like your product they're gonna talk about crap but how do you feel you know what i mean like don't worry about other people some people may love it and stuff the do you do you love it do you love yourself do you love what you're making that is the most important thing because as long as you have that then you can do everything else (laughs) yep and what was it for you that made you decide to stay an independent author or what was was the point where i said okay I start out on my own and I stay an independent author. Um, well, first thing I was out of spite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's because, a good one. Because, and just kind of to give some of the uglier truth to it, um, when I was pitching to other publishers, and not just my first novels, but um, up to, I think, maybe like my seventh novel and stuff, like when I was pitching, it was just, uh, I would hear a lot of, we don't want urban characters. We don't want, I know, we don't want uh, people of color in the front. We, we yeah, it, it was a lot. Um, we don't want to work with black authors. It was just, it was just so much. It was, I face, I'm telling you, like I face a lot and people don't realize this, the public, publishing industry is a lot more, um, uh, it's a lot more of a game than you, <laughs> than you really think. Um, there's a lot more racism than a lot of people think. So because of that, because I was experiencing that, I was like, I'm not going to change what I write about. Mm-hmm. And so I decided to learn myself um, a- along the way, of course, but how to edit properly myself, um, how to make covers myself. Um, I think it's definitely very clear where my evolution has gone, um, how to network better myself. Um, just I've just relied on myself for like a lot of things. Um and I'm really happy to have that kind of control, I guess, over my product. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I'm also just really happy. Every single thing represents me and I didn't change for anybody. Mm-hmm. And how far far would you go? Let's say an editor would suggest or a friend would suggest mm. when he or she reads what you wrote. How far would you go? How much would you change? How much would you change in your books, yeah. in your story? Nothing. <laughs> because it kind of- 
<laughs> because it because it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like I don't produce, I don't make anything public until I am happy with it. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, like I, the way I edit my books, I do it at least four times. Mm-hmm. Um, I do it as myself, another author, a reader, and another author again, mm-hmm. because I the two author segments are the most picky, uh, at least to my, at least to me the most picky ones. Um, So I I do it at least four times. So if I'm putting something out there, I was happy with it. Mm -hmm. And if you have a criticism with it, that is totally okay. I am totally happy to hear criticism. Am I going to take it? No, Mm -hmm. but, (laughs) but um, only if it's illegitimate, Mm -hmm. if it's like a legitimate criticism, like, Hey, you know, well, this is not like, maybe it's something that I skipped or something, or I didn't notice, oh, oh crap, like, I'll, I'll fix that. But um, no, if it's something like, oh, you know, well, you should do this and that, it's it's not. <laughs> I'm not going to change it. <laughs> mm, yeah. What about your future plans? What can you share with us and our audience about What's your next? plans? What's next? Yeah. Um, so I actually decided I am, uh, for the next book, it will be a lesbian ghost story. Um, so that's, that's going to be the next one. Um, I'm hoping to have, actually have it written and put it out by the end of this year or in January. Um, and then for all of next year, I'm trying to do a little more conventions. Um, I did a few this year, um, but I think next year would actually be really fun. Um, I just slowed down a little bit in the past couple of years just because I had a stroke, um, a co- two years ago. Oh, so I had to you know, pace myself. <laughs> so this year was my first year getting back in the circuit. Um, so next year, I'm just doing them a little far apart. But yeah, that's, that's what I'm looking forward to. And may I ask your ghost story, will it be set in the present day or in the past? Kind of the past, but still in the 2000s, like definitely in the 2000s, but not, um, mm-hmm. not as far back as I like to go. <laughs> but is it also set in the USA or in Europe? Or somewhere else entirely, maybe. Now that part I haven't decided. Ah, yeah. I'm like, America's not the only country. Like this, this isn't the only place for people. So I'm thinking, I'm honestly probably thinking Canada, only because I've been to Canada and I really liked it there, and I haven't written anything in Canada, Calgary specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, so something like that, or maybe Hungary. I don't, <laughs> you know, the possibilities are endless with me. You know, I've already written about like Croatia and France and like, you know, all these Morocco. So it's just like. <laughs> exactly. I mean, like you said, the possibilities are endless. And Absolutely. A lot of possibility f- possibilities for lovely research. Oh, yes. Exactly. And exactly. setting and setting as well. I mean. Mm-hmm. I mean, don't 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 be offended, but I mean, outside the United States, you get even yeah. better places for a good setting. You do. I'm so, like I've I've traveled, so I I agree. You do you do get more interesting areas and stuff. Like like I said, America's not the only place. Yeah, for your imagination. I mean, it gets your 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 cocks turning. When you think of other places, like you said, especially if you're a horror author. Exactly. It's like maybe, you know, Iceland. I've been to Iceland. I really liked it there. <laughs> But then again, I like the cold. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah maybe uh, our guests' stories would be also interesting for you. Mm-hmm. Johan mm-hmm. Thorson, if you have heard of him. Who? Johan Thorson. He was our guest on the show, and he has uh, he has a uh, United States publisher, mm-hmm. and his book came out uh, no last oh. year. Last oh. year, it was published in English, mm-hmm. not in Icelandic. For example, it's called White Sands, mm-hmm. and it does have quite a touch of the supernatural. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe Sorry. the perfect book for you. It might be. It also, might be. also with a touch of Icelandic mythology. Ooh. I mean, it's a crime fiction. It's crime fiction, but uh, it has incompro- something supernatural in there. Yeah, definitely, so definitely. A clear-cut crime. That's very interesting. Okay. 
might be your book, Tanya. Yeah, we're Tanya have to check that out, especially because I just mentioned Iceland. Like, <laughs> that's a good hit right there. <laughs> Glad I could help. And also, I mean, they write the most. In, I mean, also does not does not Irsa also write horror story uh, yep. books? Yep. Yeah, another Icelandic author. You might have heard of her because she's quite quite famous. Irsa Sigurdadottir. Yeah. Irsa Sigurdadottir. I have not. Oh. I've never. Oh. I've never. You should check her out. She writes crime fiction, uh, but she also writes horror. horror. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Maybe. You guys know I like horror. Oh. <laughs> I, sh I shall put both names in my email so you can check them out. Do it. Definitely do it. You got my email. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Get your juices flowing there, probably. Yeah, definitely do it. I'm more than happy. Like, honestly, I love, like, finding out new things and stuff. Like, the same. nobody likes the same old, same old all the time. Yeah, so. yeah. I love branching out. Let's go. <laughs> and, and then in between, come back to something you love and put yeah, it then exactly. branch out again. And put it in your books as well. Maybe. Exactly. Yeah, yeah you, you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> Tick up. More questions for our guest? Not nope. at the moment. Not at the moment. So, Kamaya, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank it you for having me. <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you for yeah. making time for us. And it was a great pleasure talking to you. It was a great talk. Pleasure talking to you, both of you. Like you're both great interviewers. Thank you. That's a great job. Such a great job. Thank <laughs> you for the compliment. You did enjoy this episode as much as we did. Then hit subscribe and don't miss the next episode. Also, make sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you like to support us and buy us a coffee, you can do so via Buy Me Coffee and other platforms. You can find all the necessary links in the description. Until next time.